So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about the Seventh-day Adventists and righteousness. Because the, the Seventh-day Adventists believe we are still under the law and we need to keep the law and repent of all our sins and to cease from all sin in order to have a chance to be saved when we are judged. Now, I want to take a look at their point of view and try to reason with them a bit here. Because... In order for you to be judged and justified by the law, you would have to be perfect. And it's not about you trying to keep the law. It's about you actually keeping it. Right? And I think that's something they fail to see. And I'm going to start here by getting into a passage that they'll bring up. And that's Ezekiel chapter 18. And this first paragraph, verses 21 through 23, says, and I will let you know that I have a video that's publishing that might pop up on me in the middle of this. So there might be an interruption randomly. It says here, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and shall keep all my statutes, that doesn't say some or try, it says to keep them all, right? And do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? So you see here where the Seventh-day Adventists would say, see, you need to turn from your sin, and sin is transgression of the law. And they'll point to the Ten Commandments and talk about keeping it. Mainly, they'll talk about keeping the, the Fourth Commandment about the Sabbath. And talk about how you're either not keeping that or you're keeping it on Sunday, which is the Roman Sabbath there. And uh, hopefully that click there prevented it from popping up, and it seemed to have worked. So uh, let's continue with this here. So they'll talk up, use that to get you to... Be like, yeah, you know what? I need to keep the law and I need to keep the Sabbath or else I want to be lost, right? But nobody's saved by keeping the law because you have to do it perfectly. And I'm going to talk about that. But not only that, this next paragraph here, they, they seem to overlook, right? Because it talks about here, if you sin and then you, you turn and you keep all the statutes, that doesn't mean you try and you keep some of them. No, it, mean, it means you actually do it, right? Then it's going to be good on you, right? But in like manner, all it takes is one sin to have all your righteousness thrown out the window. As it goes on to say here at verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, Shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed. And in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Moses is a perfect example of this. Where you could say he's living that perfect life under the law. But 
God tells them, hey, go speak to Israel and speak onto the rock so that water will come forth from it again. And he gets mad at Israel, portrays God as just an angry person, right? Who, who, who doesn't understand that you need water. And then he strikes the rock again. So not only did he portray God as this just angry, impatient man, but he strikes the rock twice when it's supposed to be struck once. And because of this, God does not allow him into the promised land. And he dies. Right? So, you see there how you can also be like Adam and Eve is another example. Living a perfect life, sinless. And all they did was eat from a, a fruit of a tree. That doesn't even seem like a big deal. Right? But because of this, they're kicked out of paradise. So you, are you actually sinless and perfect? Because unless you're sinless and perfect, your righteousness is not even going to be mentioned. All your good, not mentioned at all, as it says here. So yet, let's say you lived a good life for 20 years and you never sinned. Not believable, but let's just pretend, right? You live the last 20 years without sin. As soon as you sinned, all that righteousness not mentioned is gone. You're starting over from scratch now. It's done. So it's not about, hey, God, look, at the 20 years I was righteous. Well, yeah, but then you ended with sin. Oh, well, that's too bad for you because your righteousness is not going to be mentioned. So you may be a Seventh-day Adventist who's 20, 40, 60, 80 years old. You may have lived generally a good life. But when's the last time you sinned? Probably today, right? Well, that means all the righteousness that you think you've been doing, such as keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, is not even going to be mentioned. It's passed away, just like it was with Adam and Eve, just like it was with Moses himself. You are not going to be an exception to the rule because you tried really hard and you did good for so long. It doesn't matter. The standard is perfection. And you don't meet the, the standard. As it goes on to say, <clears throat> Yet say ye, the way the Lord is not equal. Which is what you might be saying now and starting to argue with this. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doth that which is lawful and right, he shall live his soul, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgression that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? And it, that's exactly it. Because you talk to these Seventh-day Adventists, and they'll talk about how you need to repent of your sins, or you're going to be lost. You can lose your salvation, and stuff like that, right? And they'll point at you at being some sinner, as if you need to be like them, right? Because they're not in the same damnation you are. But their ways are not equal. Because you ask them, hey, are you a sinner? And reluctantly, they'll they'll say that they're a sinner. It's like, oh, so you, you still sin. You're not perfect, right? They're like, oh, yeah, I try. I'm getting there. They're like, okay, but you're not. So you're just like me. You're a sinner. But for some reason, you think I'm going to be damned and you're not. Your ways are unequal. We're both sinners, but you think you're going to get special treatment for some reason. Why is that? Is it because you're a Pharisee? Uh, this is hard for... Seventh-day Adventists to actually think about is them being a Pharisee. It's it's weird because they, they're just like them, but they can't see it. But I wanted to bring up uh, a point here because they'll talk to you as if you're a sinner and you're a Sabbath breaker. And, 
what have you. So James chapter 2, at verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Once you got them to admit that they still sin, well, then you say here, hey, well, if you you break the law, you're guilty of the whole law. So uh, even though you didn't break the Sabbath, you broke the Sabbath. Because if you offend the law on one point, you're guilty of the whole law. So as you point the finger at me and call me a Sabbath breaker and a sinner, you yourself are a Sabbath breaker and a sinner. So your ways are unequal. You're inconsistent. Your, your view contradicts. Every time you point the finger and you condemn anybody, you're also condemning yourself. And I realize this when I call out people's sin and I'm correcting their way. At the same time, I know it's a correction to me and a correction of my ways. It's like God uses your own life and your own experiences to teach others so that you, you can learn from those and understand him and his word. So, but with the Seventh-day Adventists, they act as though, oh, that's not me. Right? I'm keeping the law. I, I'm, I look good in God's eyes. and I'm keeping a Sabbath. It's the rest of you, you're all filthy rags and sinners that need to repent and keep the Sabbath. But it's like, but you are just as much as a sinner. You see, what is the, the summing up of the law? The Seventh-day Adventists will tell you it's to love God with all you got and love your fellow man as yourself. You're like, okay, then you're breaking the law right now. And they'll be taken back for a second. You're like, yeah, because why are you doing what you're doing? You say it's to love God and love your fellow man, but ultimately, if you're being honest, you're doing it so that you, right, the focus is on you, don't go to hell. And so that you go to heaven. It's not about you loving God and loving your fellow man. It's about you loving yourself and not wanting to go to hell and wanting to go to heaven. That's what it's about. Right? So, you broke the law right off the bat. And this is revealed because I'll, I'll preach the gospel to you people. Such as the beginning of my video, I had a quick little snippet there about the, thief on, the thieves on the cross next to Jesus. And you, as said, David, probably focused on that. And you probably want to leave in the comments and say some things about it and all that, what have you. And feel free to do so. But I preach the gospel to you guys. And then all of a sudden you guys will say, you're preaching do as thou wilt. And to live in sin. When I've never once condoned sin and justified living in sin. So don't lie and say that, okay? Because you're talking about keeping the law, but then you all have no problem lying about me and what I'm saying, which makes you hypocrites, okay? So as soon as I, I'm showing you the gospel, how God saved you, he lived that perfect life under the law that you can't live, and he lived perfectly so that he could give you that life if you were willing to give him yours. It's not just give your sin to Jesus, you give your life, that's your righteousness everything you think is good about you, that you think is makes you worthy to go to heaven and not go to hell you need to lay that all down at the cross your past, present, and future the whole nine yards, all of it everything you got give it to Jesus he dies in your place so that you can be born again into his body where you are righteous because he is righteous you are covered with his righteousness but you're busy establishing your own righteousness. And I preach this to you, and you say it's a license to sin. Well, what happened to loving God and loving your fellow man? Once you realize that you don't have to worry about going to hell, you don't have to worry about missing out on heaven, all of a sudden it's a license to sin and do whatever you want to do and to live in sin? What happened to the love for God and love for your fellow man? I thought that was your motivation. But we see here that it's not. Because as soon as you hear the good news of your salvation, you think it's an open invitation to sin. Which shows that you're not doing what you're doing because you love God and love your fellow man. You're doing it because you love yourself. You're self-deceived. To wrap this up, I wanted to show you, there's, you know, two or three witnesses, right? There's... 
I'm going to show you two passages and it tells us the same thing here. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 20 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. We're not under the law, right? So it's saying it to those who are under it. That every mouth may be stopped. That's yours as well. And that all the world may become guilty before God. That includes you, Mr. and Mrs. Seventh-day Adventist. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you see there, your life living by the law and you, you're hoping that you pass judgment. You're going to be judged by the law. And that's what you want. You, you can't be justified by the law in his sight. How are you going to be saved? You're going to be saved because you think you lived a good enough life, a righteous life. And you're going to be judged by the law and, and found worthy. You, you're contradicting what we're told here about nobody being justified in his sight by the law. Because the law is there to show you that you're a sinner and you need Jesus. It's not there to show you to focus on yourself and to live this out. Because you can't do it in the first place because your intentions are impure. Because Jesus, he lived a perfect life under the law. But he didn't do it so that he wouldn't go to hell. He didn't do it so that he would go to heaven. He did it because he loves God and he loves us. He had a pure heart, pure intention. You do not. As revealed by your own words and your response to what I present to you here. We're told this again in Galatians chapter 3. Verses 10 through 12 it says, For as many as are of the work of the law are under the curse, which is you. And this is from Nehemiah, where Nehemiah talks about how Israel entered into a curse at Mount Sinai when they agreed to do everything that was said in Exodus chapters 20 through 24, where they were given the law and the judgments. And they said, this thing we will do. They entered into a curse, as it says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you miss one crossing of the T or dotting of the I, one of the least of the commandments, whatever one you think is the least that you don't need to keep, you're guilty of the whole thing. You broke the whole law. But then again, it tells us in verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Now, in the sight of man, like James chapter 2 talks about, you can be justified to yourself by keeping the law, like you Seventh-day Adventist, and to your other Seventh-day Adventist friends. By keeping the law, you're all justified in each other's sight, but not before God. As it says, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. So you see there, you walking by the law, you're not walking by faith. You're walking by the flesh. You don't see how the law was exactly what the serpent gave Adam and Eve. The knowledge of good and evil. It revealed to them that they are sinners. And what was the first thing they tried to do? Cover themselves in fig leaves. Representing self-righteousness. That's exactly what you're doing. And then you follow the way of Cain. And you're doing what God said, right? God told Adam that the land is cursed. And you're going to have to till the ground by the sweat of your brow to bring forth fruit. Well, Cain followed that, brought forth the fruit, but he was rejected. Why is that? Because it has to do with the heart. It has to do with faith. You make it too much about the outward appearance and about the letter of the law when it's about the spirit of the law, where you're showing that you're not keeping the spirit of the law, which is about loving God and loving your fellow man. Something that you're obviously not doing because as soon as you are released from the law, you don't sit there and go, well, I'm going to still do this because I love God and love my fellow man. Which shows your true sinful nature and your selfishness. And I'd like to wrap up by coming back over here to Romans. Chapter 10 here. Verses 1 through 4. 
And I like to replace Israel with the Seventh-day Adventists here. Because I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It says here in Romans 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Seventh-day Adventists is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And when you're actually set free from this, when you don't have to keep the law to avoid hell and to earn heaven, this is where it shows the true children of God. Because you do what is right because you want to. Because you love and appreciate God, that you're thankful for what he's done for you. And that you love your fellow man and you want them to get saved as well. It's like the ten lepers that Jesus healed. Leprosy representing sin. And how we're all lepers. Jesus healed ten of them. Nine of them just went about their lives. But they were still healed from the leprosy. And only one of them came back and was thankful. But we see there in that story that even if you're not thankful, you're still healed. You're still cured. As long as you've come to Jesus and you've been healed, you've been saved from the curse of sin. You may not like that, but it's about God and his mercy and his grace. Not about us and what we do for God and what we do for a fellow man. It's not about us living a perfect life and about us keeping the law. It's not about us at all. It's about Jesus and how he saved these people, even though they were in sin, they didn't deserve it. And even after they were saved and born again into the family of God, they still went back to their vomit. It's to the glory of God. I don't know how he saves his own children. In spite of themselves. It's about his mercy, his grace, his works that he has done. How he kept the law perfectly. How he alone is pure and righteous and just and good. Where you trying to establish your own righteousness is being like Lucifer in Isaiah 14 saying, You're going to be like God. No, you're not. You're deceiving yourself. Just like Paul talks about how the law deceived him. So that being said, hope you think about these things. Thanks for watching. Take care. All right. I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world, and that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud, and you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. 
This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he's, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word? In John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified, and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless, you want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change, where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that... Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, 
Moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness, he says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. 
So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tie, didn't tie. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. <laughs> you have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.